It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. This is a question for the Premier about his leadership and his standards for his hand-picked senior staff. According to reports, Dean French, the Premier's hand-picked Chief of Staff, ordered senior political aides to direct police to raid cannabis stores the day marijuana became legal, with the goal of getting people in handcuffs on the noon hour news. Can the Premier confirm, confirm these reports, Speaker? Premier. Well, first of all, through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to welcome all the firefighters down here. We've been putting out fires for the mess. We've been a fire for 15 years down here. That we be having to be put out. Anyway, I also want to acknowledge, I believe they're young Army cadets, and I apologize if you aren't, but I want to welcome our young Army cadets up there. Thank you for your service. Through you, Mr. Speaker, since day one, our priority has been to protect communities and, and children, combating illegal, black market, and organized crime. We were very clear, illegal dispensaries have no place in Ontario, and operators would face stiff Bonds. penalties and to be shut down. Ministers, MPP staff at every level agree these places need to be shut down. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier knows, or he should know, that his office is supposed to stay clear of the day to day police operations. Instead, it seems that Dean French, the Premier's Chief of Staff, not only attempted to direct day-to-day -day police operations, but was actually demanding that police make arrests in order to get the story the government wanted on the noon hour news. Order. Has the Premier even spoken to his Chief of Staff about this incident? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying earlier, ministers, MPPs, staff at every single level, we need to shut down these illegal dispensaries. Yeah, yeah. Again, we need to shut down the illegal pot shops. Our expectation Mr. is that police will and always will enforce the law. Today, 91 per cent of illegal dispensaries are shut down in the four largest areas. Peel, York, Ottawa, and Toronto. You notice I never mentioned Hamilton. I will never apologize for protecting the people of this province. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Government House Leader, come to order. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. Member for Mississauga Malton, come to order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, this is fundamentally about the Premier's understanding of the necessity of having a separation between the police and the government. That's right. The role of the police is to serve and protect the people of this province, and the Premier's role is to let them do their job. In a democratic society, Speaker, the government does not demand that police make arrests to generate noon hour news hits. The buck stops with the Premier on this issue, Speaker. Does he think the actions of Dean French, his hand picked chief, chief of staff, are acceptable? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Our job is to make laws. The police's job is to enforce the laws, and I support the police. Unlike the Leader of the Opposition and the NDP, we support our police. They're doing a magnificent job. Again, 91 per cent of illegal dispensaries have been shut down in the fourth, four largest cities in Ontario. We're proud of them. And we need to shut down every single illegal dispensary in this province. We need to protect our children. We need to protect our communities. And that's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. 
Speaker. Stop the clock. Member for Essex, come to order. 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 Start the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but it's disturbing that the Premier doesn't think that the police know how to do their own job without yeah. having the government interfere yeah. in the process. But this is not the only concerning story, Speaker, emerging from the Premier's office this week. As the Order. Premier knows, Ali Ken Valshi will be collecting a $500,000 severance after a single day on the job, thanks to an intervention by the Premier's Chief of Staff, Dean French. Yesterday, the Premier said he hadn't even spoken to his Chief of Staff wow. about this. Right. When will he? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd love the, the Leader of the Opposition to actually come up with something substantial, like saving taxpayers money, lowering taxes, lowering hydro rates. Yeah. But if you notice how it works every single day, Mr. Speaker, it's just personal attacks. They must not be happy people over there. But I can tell you, OPG is responsible for their own staffing issues, and maybe they, they should be looking over at their staffing issues. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, we have an Opposition Day motion today urging the government to pay for take-home cancer drugs for people who need them. Perhaps that's substantive enough for the government to support us. In that. But what we are seeing, though, disturbingly, Speaker, is a pattern here, and it's problematic. The Premier's hand-picked chief of staff runs roughshod over all of the rules. The Ontario people get stuck with the bill, and in this case, it's a half a million dollar bill, and the Premier denies that anything's even happened wow. and refuses to even ask his staff what is going on. That is not leadership, Speaker. Has the Premier spoken to his chief of staff about his role in firing Ali Ken Valshi and generating this half a million dollar waste of public money. Premier. I just wish the Leader of the Opposition, through you, Mr. Speaker, so focused on OPG. Why don't you start focusing on reducing hydro rates, putting money back into the taxpayer's pocket, reducing taxes, stimulating the economy, creating jobs, but the Leader of the Opposition knows one thing, and that's attack. Attack. OPG is responsible for their own staffing issues, and that's the way it's going to be. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier and his hand-picked Chief of Staff think that think, think, seem to think that the government uh, means that they can Order. do whatever they want, whenever they want, and stick people, the people of Ontario with the bill. That's what they think government's all about. And it's mostly a bill that's due to the Premier's own vendettas against people that he doesn't like. The people of Ontario should not be stuck with a $500,000 bill because the Premier doesn't like someone. And the, peop and the police of this province should never, ever, ever be told to make arrests in order to generate a photo op for the government. The Premier cannot pretend that this simply isn't happening. Has he spoken to his Chief of Staff? And if so, what did he say? I believe um, there was a statement made in that question that imputed motive. I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. Motive, I'm going to ask her to withdraw. Yeah. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, I think the police in this province know pretty clearly who supports them and who doesn't support them. Exactly. You know, the, police know, the police know that we're up there holding signs saying we love the police. They're holding signs that say bleep the police. That, 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 again, that again, Mr. Speaker, is unacceptable. We will support our police. We have confidence in our police because the police are doing their job. Stop the clock. Order. 
Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Questions also for the Premier, but I have to say, thankfully, the police in this province know not to let a government lead them down the Ipperwash <laughs> path again. This speaker is also a question about the Premier's standards for Cabinet Ministers. According Order to multiple reports, side. a female staffer working for the then Opposition Conservatives came forward with a complaint of sexual misconduct concerning the Minister of Finance. Yesterday, the Premier said that an independent investigation Order. of these allegations has already been conducted. So the question is, uh, can uh, the Premier tell us now who conducted this investigation? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and for the 20th time, there was a third-party investigation, and there is zero, zero evidence. It was Order. just a bunch of nonsense, and I support, I support my minister a thousand percent. please take their seats. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has stated that he has zero tolerance for sexual misconduct and that uh, he will always act decisively to deal with it. Yet over the last month, he has prevented key facts from coming forward to the public when dealing with these issues. If an independent investigation has happened, the government should be able to tell us who conducted it and what, the, what they found. What were the results? Will he provide some evidence, some evidence that an independent investigation actually did occur. It's not a matter of, I say so, so just trust me. It's a matter of, I say so, and here's the evidence. That's how people build trust, people. Or is this yet just another time that the Premier is asking people to simply accept his word without any evidence? Members will please take your seats. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. You know something? Throwing stones in a glass house doesn't work in this, in this arena here. Why doesn't the Leader of the Opposition look into her two MPPs that are under investigation for treating their employees like a piece of dirt? They're under investigation. Her two MPPs. I'd like the Leader of the Opposition to answer about her own house. Not about this Order. house, about her own house. Next question, the member for Brampton South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, one of the core commitments of our government um, is to create and protect good jobs here in Ontario. Here, here. However, the previous Liberal government pursued policies that made life harder and less affordable for Ontario families and businesses. For 15 years, Ontario's businesses struggled to keep up with Liberal taxes and regulation, and many paid the price. It was time for change. Our government is committed to sending a message to the world that Ontario is open for business. Could the minister please inform the House about how he plans to increase competitiveness for businesses in Ontario and Canada? Good question. Minister Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Brampton South. Back in September, we wrote to the federal government to ask them to take bold action in their fall economic statement today to support businesses in Ontario and across Canada. Yesterday, Premier Ford asked the federal government to include 100 per cent in-year accelerated capital cost depreciation in their fall statement. A measure like this, it's a very technical measure, but a measure like this would encourage new and immediate investment in Ontario industries. We look forward to working with the federal government to strengthen Ontario's competitiveness in the global economy. Last week, our fall economic statement cleared the path for us to do exactly this. We will continue to work to ensure Ontario reclaims Fox. its place as the economic engine of Canada. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is reassuring to hear that our government stands firm in our commitment to lowering taxes to support employers so they can create 
and invest and grow jobs here in Ontario. Here, here, here. The time for bold action is now. Recent U.S. tax reform and policy decisions provide the U.S. with a competitive advantage over Ontario and Canada. We must continue to work to create an environment in which Ontario businesses can thrive. The people of Ontario are counting on us to do everything we can to ensure the strength of our economy for generations to come. Could the minister further explain how we will strengthen Ontario's competitiveness and ensure the world knows that Ontario is open Great for business? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. In uh, our fall economic statement, we also include provisions for tax measures to strengthen Ontario's economy. Now, this could include paralleling any federal government response today to our written request to accelerate capital cost depreciation of new assets. We're ready to work with the federal government to address the competitiveness challenges posed by the U.S. tax reform. The risk of inaction is simply too great to stand idly by. We hope the federal government listens to Premier Ford's request of yesterday and shares our concerns. We must take action to improve our competitiveness before we see further erosion on investment, jobs and growth opportunities in Ontario. In doing so, Speaker, the world will know that Ontario is open for business. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Uh, last evening, this legislature was filled with everyday working people looking for some pretty basic benefits on the job. The Premier might not think that a paid sick day matters, and we know he's never had to live on the minimum wage, but for the people who make this province work, it's a big deal. As the Premier scales back people's Order. rights, what does he have to say to them? Premier. To you, Mr. Speaker. When I crisscrossed this province, the number one issue next to hydro was Bill 148. When I talked to the most needy people in society, they told me that they got laid off because of Bill 148. Tens of thousands of people lost their job under Bill 148. It discouraged companies from all over the world to come to Ontario and open business because of Bill 148. It was the worst bill, the worst job-killing bill. It was the worst for people, the most vulnerable people in society, to get a hand up. They want a job. We're getting rid of Bill 148. We're going to open the business here in Ontario. We're going to create jobs, lower taxes, lower high rates. When, when the standing ovation is so loud that I can't hear the person who has the floor, I have to interrupt the person who has the floor. Order. Start the clock. Next supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier can yell as loud as he wants, but he's been pretty crystal clear on what his priorities are. Last week, he passed a tax cut for himself and some of the wealthiest people in this province. But working people, working people are going to lose paid sick days, lose basic protections on the job, and if you're earning the minimum wage, you're going to lose nearly $2,000 a year in wages because of the choices and priorities of this Premier. How does this Premier justify that? Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker. Well, there are two items in the fall economic statement, Speaker. First of all, what the uh, Leader of the Opposition was referring to is the tax credits. This goes, had they read it closely, Speaker, Waterloo. they would realize Order. this tax credit goes to seniors, those with disabilities, Order. and those who claim Ontario's expense tax credit. They are the ones who suffer the most under the Liberal tax increases. In this fall economic statement, 
3,000 filers with allowable Ontario medical expense would have paid $320 more in personal income tax. With our decision, these filers will pay $35 million less in personal income tax. That's who's benefiting. Those, those in addition to the 1.1 million, million low-income earners in Ontario. Who Next question, the member for start the clock. Member for Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Why, just this morning we wrapped up Bill 47, our government's first step toward making Ontario open for business. Over the course of this debate, we've heard members of the opposition refer to the businesses as bottom feeders. We've heard special interests say that small business owners shouldn't be in business if they can't handle more regulation and higher costs and higher taxes. But recent studies have shown that this approach has cost Ontario 56,000 jobs and took $23 billion out of Ontario's economy. Speaker, can the minister inform the House? what the government's next steps will be beyond Bill 47. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, thanks, Speaker. I'd like to thank our Deputy Whip for a great uh, question this morning. You know, the debate on Bill 47 told us a lot about how the opposition feels about businesses in the province of Ontario. Yesterday, between the hackles and their speeches, Mr. Speaker, Member it became clear that members of the official opposition think that businesses for shouldn't Waterloo make money. They order. refer to them as vindictive and bottom feeders, Mr. Speaker. Shameful. It's unacceptable. Shameful. You know, that's not this government's policy, Speaker. This government knows the best way to ensure that there are good jobs in Ontario is to make sure there are competitive businesses here, here. in Ontario. Here, here. After question period, we're going to vote on Bill 47. I hope there are members over there who believe that we should wind down the Ontario College yeah, yeah. of Trade, and I hope there are members over there that believe we should create a competitive Spot. environment for business in Ontario. We want to make Ontario open for business, Mr. Speaker, and we hope they'll support us in doing that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his very thoughtful answer. And yesterday, the, mis the minister said that our government understood both the ambitions and the aspirations that small business owners had for their future. I know the small business owners in my riding of Barry Springwater or Medante had a hard time adjusting to the attack that the old, tired Bill 148 unleashed on them. Some responded by scaling back business hours and raising prices, but some just outright had to close their doors. Some who had been in business for years ended up closing their doors entirely and will not reopen. I know Ontario can do better, and I know the minister does too. Can the minister tell the House how the government is going to build on the success of Bill 47? Minister. Boy, that's another great question from a member from the Barrie area, Mr. Speaker. Later today, I'm actually going to be headed to New Brunswick as my first stop to try and open more markets yeah, yeah. for Ontario's businesses. Then, Tomorrow night and Friday, I'll be in Montreal. I'll be joining my colleagues from the other provinces and territories so that we can break down trade barriers across the country so that Ontario's businesses can have trade from Nanaimo to New Glasgow so that we can break down those interprovincial walls that exist, Mr. Speaker. It's going to take more than opening up more access to the market, though. We have to get off the back of our small businesses and medium-sized businesses. That means we have to get rid of the over-regulation, Mr. Speaker. 380,000 pieces of regulation in this province compared to half that in British Columbia, which is a pretty good place to live, Mr. Speaker. We have to make some big-time cuts to red tape so that business Response. owners can continue to feel the relief. I can tell you, after the election, Mr. Speaker, there was a sigh of relief when that party lost the election and we won from the business community. Yeah. The House will come to order. Start the clock. Next question.
The member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Masonville Public School, Tweedsmuir Public School, Kettle Creek Public School, these are just a few of the schools in the London area that are currently awaiting funding for additions and renovations that were promised by the previous Liberal government. But that funding has not flowed. Matt Reed, the chair of the Thames Valley District School Board, said, and I quote, these previously approved and announced projects need to move forward and it should not be held up because of politics. These communities have been waiting for far too long in order to have permanent additions and a local school in their community. We can't be playing politics with our kids." Unquote. Speaker, why is this government playing politics with London area students and families by preventing much needed school Question. funding from flowing? The Premier for Health. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Much for the question, and our government is committed to ensuring that our students have access to safe learning environments. The chair that's and in fact, Peggy. to correct the situation, to tell you what is actually happening is the money for these projects has been allocated. There is no pause or delay in the approval yes. project. Yes. Approval process yeah. for these capital projects. The Ministry of Education has been working closely and collaboratively politics. with the school boards to get these projects built. Ministry officials and the minister's staff continue to be in frequent contact the with the school board politics. to build these schools with the speed, order. quality, and the value that taxpayers expect. Supplementary. Speaker, the $67.4 million that was promised for London and area school projects has yet to be released. Staff from the Thames Valley District School Board have been in regular contact with the Ministry of Education, but all they are getting is the runaround. They, are, they have got no timelines on when or even if these projects will move ahead. In addition to school speaker, much-needed childcare and family centres are also on the line. In London, Belmont, St. Thomas, Thomas, Rodney, Dorchester, Woodstock, and Ingersoll. Speaker, children and families in the London area need answers. Will the $67.4 million that was promised for London and area school projects be coming? Yes or no? Minister? Yes. As I indicated previously, the school board is working with the ministry to make sure that these projects come forward. There is no political interference whatsoever here. This has been allocated. It Except is happening. The and the board the is working week, with the Ministry of Education to make sure, as I said before, that our students have access to safe learning environments and that these projects are going to be continuing as they are supposed to be with the necessary speed, careful consideration, and to make sure that taxpayers receive the value that they expect from these projects. It is Next question, a member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have a question about student safety today to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for decades, ministers of transportation, including me, um, relied on a report from uh, Transport Canada from 1984 that concluded that school buses were safer because of the design of the seats and so on, were safer without seat belts for uh, children riding on them. Through the media, specifically through CBC, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we've now learned that a 2010 Trans, uh, Transport Canada study concluded that three-point seat belts would save lives. That report was not uh, circulated publicly, as far as we know, Mr. Speaker. I assume that the minister has seen these reports in the uh, the media. And my question to him is whether he has requested the 2010 Transport Canada report, whether he has seen that report, and if so, would he share his own conclusions on the need for increased school bus safety with the people of Ontario? And the children in school buses. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question from the member opposite, and uh, I'm pleased to field my first uh, question on transportation. In the yeah. 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 I appreciate uh, the, the concern brought forward, and, and my ministry and I are looking at uh, 
at the report with regards to the seatbelts. I, in fact, uh, will be speaking to Transport uh, Minister Mark Garneau in the next few days, uh, and that's an issue that I'll be raising with them. I think the federal government has a role to play uh, in ensuring that uh, uh, if, if they want to go down that road of regulating seatbelts in the school buses, that uh, we can work in partnership with the uh, federal government in seeing how uh, that could come to fruition. But I appreciate the question. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that the minister is going to uh, speak with uh, Minister Garneau. Um, of course, the federal government has already said they are going to review those uh, regulations, and I think that's a, a good thing. You know, the reality is that uh, 6, 000, there have been over 6,000 documented injuries and 16 deaths since 1999 on school buses, and I think it's fair to say that. Uh, all of us who have been trans transportation ministers in the country, had we had the advantage of knowing about that report, we would have moved in this direction much more quickly. So in the meantime, Order. in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, I'm asking the minister whether he would provide national leading leadership by supporting mandatory seatbelt legislation in Ontario school buses. This is the largest province. You can lead the way. And I'm actually going to offer you an opportunity. That next week we'll be debating Bill 50. Which is my uh, private member's bill, which would make three point seat belts mandatory in all school buses. Can we count on your support, Mr. Speaker? Minister? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of surreal that uh, I'm now being asked questions from the former Premier of the province who had you know, 15 years while in office yeah. to make these changes necessary uh, and didn't do it. If it was a priority for her then, it would have been done, and it's unfortunate they didn't do it. What I, will promise this house, Mr. what I will promise this House is that I work with the member opposite on this issue to review it to ensure that uh, we will take action if necessary going forward. But again, we need the partnership and the, and the direction from uh, the federal government, and we're willing to have that conversation with them. And uh, going forward, I hope we can do the benefit because our focus of this government is the people of Ontario, and it's the safety of our kids uh, throughout the province that uh, we want to ensure, and we'll continue to work towards that. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Our government is committed to making Ontario open for business. In the short time our government has been in office, we have already done so much to mark the end of the liberal tax and spend policy approach. Small businesses suffered for 15 long years under the previous liberal government and all of Ontario paid the price. That is why we scrapped the cap-and-trade carbon tax and have introduced legislation, if passed, will repeal the most damaging aspects of Bill 148. Ontario small businesses provide good jobs, support our economy, and are the foundations of our communities. Could the minister please explain the steps our government is taking in the fall economic statement to further support small businesses in Ontario. Mr. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Milton for the question. We are taking action, Speaker, to stop the damaging policies the previous Liberal government was prepared to put in place. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government took a page out of their federal cover, uh, government's playbook. The federal government introduced a measure to remove the small business corporate income tax rate on the amount of passive income earned by a corporation. In 2018, the Ontario Liberal government decided to join in on this assault on small business. In our federal economic statement, we announced that we are not proceeding with this proposal. Instead, we will provide support to small business that's been missing for 15 long years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, back to the minister. Our small businesses were handed challenge after challenge by the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. High electricity rates, punishing taxes, and the restrictive measures of Bill 148 are just some of the things businesses had to overcome. Unfortunately, many of them simply could not succeed. The odds were stacked against them, Mr. Speaker. As businesses closed up shop and fled the province, it was clear help was needed. 
but to the relief of small business owners and employees across this province, Ontario is finally open for business. Could the minister please describe the significance of her decision to not proceed with a Liberal proposal to phase out access to the small business deduction based on the passive income a Question. corporation earns? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. The Liberals' 2018 budget continued their assault on small business by eliminating the lower tax rate. Yeah. This measure would have increased taxes on Ontario small businesses by about $160 million annually by 2020 and 2021. Speaker, that is absolutely unacceptable. Premier Ford has made it very clear that individuals, families and businesses in Ontario pay enough taxes already. We will not be imposing any new taxes on the hard-working people of the province of Ontario. After 15 years of Liberal waste, Order. mismanagement and scandals, Ontario families and businesses can finally breathe a sigh of relief. We have made a commitment to make Ontario open for business. Order. The House will come to order. The member for York Centre come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, while school capital projects grind to a halt in the London area and other education programs are left in limbo, parents, students and teachers across Ontario are on edge, waiting to see what cuts are coming for their local schools. With the release of a new funding formula consultation, uh, the government is now focusing exclusively on finding efficiencies in our already strained education system. People are right to be worried. Will the Premier tell anxious families exactly what cuts the government has planned for schools across this province? Will it be more cuts from school repairs, special needs assistance, or after school programs? Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you very much for the question, but uh, Mr. Speaker, through you, what I can tell the member is what people are actually worried about and concerned about is a $15 billion deficit that we have very concerned about that because we know that we are spending a billion dollars a month on interest to pay that debt. We've got to get that deficit Member for Waterloo control, come to order. and that's what we're working on. So we are making sure, first of all, that our number one priority in education is making sure that each child has a safe and meaningful education in a building that is appropriate for them. So that is what we are concerned with. But in order to be able to do that, and it's no secret, we've indicated that we're taking a look at each and every program in each and every ministry Response. to make sure that we can find those efficiencies, because that $15 billion deficit isn't just going to disappear. We've got to work hard on that. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, that was, a, that was a, a slightly different response when uh, the member from London West asked specifically yeah. about the Thames Valley schools that are going to be stopped, the repairs that are being stopped. Absolutely, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, through, through you to the Premier again. Um, I actually think that people are more worried, families are more worried about the fact that their kids Remember are going to be Niagara sitting West, with their hats and mitts on again in classes this winter. How are they supposed to learn? 
when the Conservatives cut $100 million in school repair funding this summer, Premier, come to order. Boards were left scrambling and projects had Government to House Leader, come to order. Year Member for Niagara West, of come to order. By Conservative and Liberal governments have led us to a $16 billion, you want to talk billions? $16 billion de repair backlog for our schools. Now, this government is looking for more places Question. to cut and is taking things from bad to worse. How many school projects and in what communities will they have to be? For York Centre, come to order. Premier, come to order. How much deeper to cut? Minister. Minister. That was a lot. Well, uh, it's hard to know where to start here, Mr. Speaker, but yeah. first of all, to go back to the situation with the Thames Valley School Board, as I indicated in the previous answer to the question from the uh, member from London West, Which the chair that is politics. continuing. That work is continuing. Those projects have been approved. Our, the boards of education and the and the Ministry of Education are working together to keep those projects moving. With respect to your suggestion about cuts, that's not happening. What we are looking for is efficiencies in the way that those services are being delivered. And there's a big difference between those two issues. We want to make sure that every child has a safe and comfortable learning environment. Yeah. That's our number one priority. Yeah. That is what we were focusing on, and that is working, what we're working on very hard to, very hard to deliver. Yeah. As we also address that $15 billion debt that is worrying response. people, that is stifling the government's responsibility yeah. to continue to deliver those services. But first and foremost, thank you. Next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, my question is. All right. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Park. Huh. This week, Ontarians were able to enjoy some of the lowest cash prices in over a year. Here, here. Yeah. The residents of my riding of Markham Thornhill are able to have some peace of mind knowing that our government is putting every effort towards making life more affordable for them and ensuring we are keeping our promises. This drop marked the beginning of many more savings this government plan to provide and just a small part of what Ontarians can expect. Last week, the Minister of Finance introduced the full economic statement. He highlighted some of the important steps our government has made. Can the minister update with this legislation what his ministry has done to keep our promise of relief to the residents of Ontario? Yeah. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through, through you to the member from Markham Hill, and thank you for that question. Um, he, he's quite correct. Uh, the Minister of Finance and the President of the Treasury Board led a discussion last, uh, and, uh, last week which had indicated that $3.2 billion worth of savings had already been found by our government. Okay. Swift action by our government has already returned $2.7 billion and identified a significant tax relief. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected to put money back into people's pockets, and one of the ways that we did that was by eliminating the cap-and-trade carbon tax that was taken from Ontario families. By the passage of that act, we will return $260 a year to an average family. Mr. Speaker, as the member mentioned, those savings are already being felt at the pump. Just this morning at the Costco on Kingston Road, Mr. Speaker, 98.6 cents a litre, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Member for Center, come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer. He's had a large role to play in providing the relief to the people of Ontario, and his card work is clearly paying off. There is, however, one thing that runs off the risk of allowing his relief to be taken away from our province, though. The Prime Minister has made it clear he plans to impose his own carbon tax on this province. Shame. Shame. A tax that will make a cash prices higher, a tax that will raise the cost to here our homes, Shame. a tax that will increase the cost of almost everything. Shame. And let's be clear, 
a tax that Ontario can't afford. Here, here, here. Can the minister tell us what we can expect should the federal carbon tax be imposed on this problem? Question. Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, by 2022, people in Canada, Ontarians can expect, families can expect, $648. Wow. That's the cost of the Trudeau carbon tax. And okay. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of the Environment federally says they're not done. They're putting in place the framework. Putting in place the framework. So, but $648, that's what the FAO said. Mr. Speaker, our Premier is assembling a coalition. A coalition of provinces, now six of them, that oppose the federal carbon tax, that oppose what is going on in Ottawa, and we will do everything in our power to make sure that there is transparency about the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, the finance minister spoke about measures on the gas tank so people can see on the gas pump what the cost per litre it is, on their natural gas tank, what the cost on the bill. Mr. Speaker, we will make sure Ontarians know what it's costing, and we will use everything in our power to stop the Trudeau carbon tax. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Last night, the government rejected Univer Ryerson University's plans for a new law school. This is now the sixth cancellation universities have seen from this government. I apologize to the member. I can't hear his question. I would ask the House to come to order, both sides of the House to come to order. I apologize again. I'll give you extra time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that. I couldn't hear myself. <laughs> My question is for the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Last night, the government rejected Ryerson's University's, Ryerson University's plan for a new law school. This is now the sixth cancellation universities have seen from this government. Ryerson was closing a gap by offering innovative programming with a focus on social justice and mandatory work placements. The law school has passed multiple approvals since 2015 and was going to offer access to law school at a lower price. Why did the minister reject these plans in the last stage of approval? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite for the question. Speaker, the people of Ontario gave this government a mandate to restore respect for taxpayers. And part of that process is making sure that government services and programs are efficient and effective. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, my ministry reviewed the submission by Ryerson University to create a new Juris Doctor program at their university. And my ministry considers many factors in making a recommendation. Factors like whether the program duplicates other programs, whether there is labour market demand, whether there is student demand, the proposed tuition rates, and the program's alignment with the institution's strategic mandate agreement. My ministry Order. and I came to the same conclusion that at this time, Response. it was not in the interest of the people of Ontario to approve the proposal. However, I am absolutely committed to working with Ryerson University. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So many Ontarians have been priced out of access to our legal system. They can't afford to hire lawyers, and those who want to be lawyers can't afford to go to law school. Ryerson proposed an innovative law school with a focus on access to the justice system for all people in our province. The proposal emphasized a lower tuition fee, still ridiculously high, but at $20,000, half of what the amount of some of our other law schools in the province. And this would have been a welcome addition to Ontario's post-secondary sector. But instead, the government is scrapping the project without revealing the cost of the cancellation. This is the same story that was spun about the cancelled campuses in Brampton, Milton and Markham. Millions of dollars had already gone into these projects, which have now been wasted. So can the minister tell the House today how much public money has been wasted on cancelling yet another university project what, that was well on its way to fruition? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in government. And that includes making decisions which 
may be difficult, but are ultimately in the interests of the people of Ontario. We have come to the decision that at this time we will not be supporting a Juris Doctor program at Ryerson. Speaker, I must say that I am surprised by the NDP's inability to respect the taxpayer. They continue to demonstrate that the people of Ontario cannot trust them to govern in an effective and efficient manner, which puts the interest of the people Order. first. Unlike the Liberals who promised everything and the NDP who will say yes to anything, we are focused on respecting taxpayers and ensuring that the services Order. and programs of our government su supports are efficient and effective. Great Thank job. you. Order. Start the clock. Next question, member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Oh. Minister, last week, Bill 47 was before the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Presenters talked about the changes proposed by the government that would reform the apprenticeship and skilled trade system in Ontario. The proposed changes in the legislation, if passed, would wind down the Ontario College of Trades, standardize the journey person to apprentice ratios, and place a moratorium on classifications and reclassification in Ontario. I have heard from many skilled trade businesses in Simcoe North how excited they are about here, these here. changes. Here, here. Can the minister tell us what job creators told the committee and why we know that the legislation, if passed, will create better jobs for Ontario? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Speaker, employers impressed upon the committee the need to pass Bill 47 in order to create good quality jobs for the people of Ontario and to address the skills gap. Sean Reed from the Progressive Contractors Association said, all of the data from Build Force Canada and other think tanks who are studying this issue show that we have a massive shortage of labour in our province right now, and it is only getting worse. Mr. Reed went on to say, I've talked to many members. In one case, one fellow had 35 resumes of people he was ready to employ, but he could not even hire one of them because of the ratios. Speaker, employers clearly emphasize that Bill 47 is on the right track to create good quality jobs and will help fulfill our promise to the people of Response. Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is great to hear that job creators in Ontario are responding so positively to the proposed changes to the skilled trades and apprenticeship system in Ontario. I also know that both employers and organized labour have been quoted saying the Ontario College of Trades was not operating effectively. Even the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Executive Chairman said the college was unable to achieve its mandate. Meanwhile, Layuna says the college created enormous amounts of red tape confusion. Speaker, it is clear from the committee and the public comments of stakeholders that the College of Trades was an impediment to the apprenticeship system in Ontario. Can the minister tell us more about why the passage Member of the for Ontario come to order. Open for Business Act for is an important step in this government, Question. keeping its promise to create better skilled trade jobs and make Ontario open for business? Here, here. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, employers said loud and clear during committee that Bill 47 will create jobs in the skilled trades. Patrick McManus of the Ontario Skilled Trades Alliance said, this is a very critical change for the skilled trades, and the opportunity for employment is actually going to significantly grow. He went on to say that he estimates that the changes will create tens of thousands of well-paying, high-quality jobs. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jamie Adam, president of Pioneer Craftsman, said, with the aging workforce in Ontario, we need to act now if we want to start to close that skills gap. Right. Thankfully, Bill 47 is a huge step in the right direction. Pioneer Craftsman, my company, currently has four apprentices. This legislation will allow us to hire immediately two additional apprentices. They are going to receive the additional skills, training, and support they need to become highly skilled tradespeople. Speaker, Bill 47 will create good quality jobs. Jobs, and I encourage the opposition to support making on Thank you. Stop the clock.
Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. This government is reopening a loophole that scraps rent control protections for tenants in new rental units, even though the Premier said during the campaign, sure, and I quote, side. when it comes Minister to rent Natural control, to we're order. going to maintain the status quo, end quote. Can the minister explain this reversal and tell us why this government thinks that landlords should have the power to double or triple their tenants' rent at any time? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, with all due respect uh, to the member opposite, we are upholding our commitment to tenants across this province. We made that commitment during the campaign. Made it in the fall economic statement. But, Speaker, we have a housing supply shortage, especially in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. We cannot accept the status quo that over the last 15 years the previous government brought no ideas to the table to increase housing supply. Speaker, we're going to work with stakeholders. We're going to listen to people when they have good suggestions, unlike the previous government. Speaker, the only way, the only way to create an atmosphere for new purpose-built rental housing in this province was to do exactly what our government wants. Once again, I had to interrupt the member who had the floor because I couldn't hear because of the standing ovation. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And with all respect to the minister, when the last Conservative government scrapped rent control, it did not create new affordable housing. Scrapping rent control didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. It will only make renting more expensive and more stressful for tenants. Instead of letting landlords reach into tenants' pockets whenever they want, the government should be investing in new affordable housing that will help families get a leg up in life. So why is this minister cutting $100 million for affordable housing programs this year alone? Yay. Minister. Speaker, again, with all due respect to the member opposite, we're cancelling the development charge rebate program, which would only benefit 13 municipalities. Wow. By moving forward and lifting that exemption for new units, we're going to create housing in 444 yeah. municipalities. I've said uh, to this member before, and I'm going to say to all members of the House, we want to work across party lines. Our housing supply action plan has an opportunity for all voices to come together, to have those good suggestions on how we can increase speed, on how we can have a better mix, on how we for can Ottawa reduce Centre, come costs, on how we can listen to both landlords for and, tenants, North, come door. and most important speaker, for Toronto how Centre, we can come look door. at innovative ways to increase the housing supply. That's what our housing supply action plan will do. And I, again, I challenge this Pause. member and every member of the opposition to participate in a positive way to increase housing. The House will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Under the governance of the previous government, our families, businesses, students, and senior citizens had difficulty making ends meet. It was a very difficult situation, and it's clear that winter is coming. It's especially difficult because energy poverty was the reality for so many, as Ontario's hydro rates, the highest in North America over the years, forced people to choose between eating and heating, and severely hindered Ontario's rural economy. Bill 32, the Access to Natural Gas Act, proposes to reach 78 communities 
communities and give the great people of our province an affordable home heating option. Can the minister please update the House on the status of the bill? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for the question. I would also like to uh, thank the members on the Standing Committee on General Government, particularly uh, my parliamentary assistant, the member from King Vaughan, for all of his hard work on Bill 32. Mr. Speaker, the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell is correct. Skyrocketing hydro bill, bills stemming from the former Liberal government was a primary contributor to increasingly unaffordable living costs in Ontario. I am so pleased to stand here as Minister of Infrastructure in the government for the people, led by our Premier, to put more money back in people's pockets. Speaker, we understand that the people are struggling to heat their homes. Unlike the Liberals, we are properly addressing affordability costs in Ontario. Rather than trying to ban Response. natural gas in Ontario, our government will reach rural, remote, northern and First Nations communities, make life affordable and open Ontario for business. I thank the Minister for his bold leadership. I know that I speak on behalf of my constituents and all Ontarians when I say that we're looking forward to creating prosperity for dozens of far-flung uh, rural communities. ...customers and families can save between $800 and $2,500 per year just by switching from electric heat, propane or oil to natural gas. That's big savings for the people in rural and northern communities. By eliminating the carbon tax, Families will have $80 more per year and businesses will have $285 per year. Sector is also one of the world's most diverse and uh, supporting 1.2 million jobs. That's one in eight Ontario workers. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the House how constituents and affected groups are reacting to our government's natural gas question. policy? Minister. Well, what a great question, and absolutely, uh, Mr. Speaker. The response we have received back from numerous individuals has been uplifting, to say the least, and I would like to take the opportunity to highlight a few examples. For instance, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce had this to say about our proposed legislation. Bill 32 will allow rural and northern communities to realize their potential and become economic drivers for Ontario. Bill 32 sends a clear signal that Ontario is open for business. Inspiringly, inspiring words to say the least, Mr. Speaker. Further encouraging commentary we have heard about this legislation comes, comes from the town of South Bruce, who stated that what they like about our government's proposal compared to the previous governments is that, and I quote, this is much broader, so we are going to see gas expansion to many more communities than under the previous Kathleen Wynne's government." Un unquote. Mr. Speaker, I greatly look forward to this bill being brought back for third reading, and hopefully it will receive unanimous support from all parties. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kingston, the Island. Start the clock. Member for Kingston, the Island. Uh, there were, uh, my question is to the Premier through you, Mr. Speaker. There are reports today that the Ontario government plans to copy Australia's climate change policy. Australia's policy reverses po the polluter pay principle and instead forces taxpayers to pay polluters. What wor what's worse is that since this policy was implemented, Australia's emissions have gone up, Mr. Speaker. Did the Premier have the Environmental Commissioner fired because he did not want his climate change policy to be subjected? to independent scrutiny. Premier. Minister of Environment. Minister of the Environment and Long Term. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, I, I do thank him for the question. Mr. Speaker, we were elected on a clear promise to reduce costs to get rid of the cap-and-trade program, to fight the carbon tax, but also bring forward a balanced plan exactly. on the environment. That's what we'll do. And in looking to that balanced plan, we are looking, yes, around the world, looking at programs like the reverse auction in Australia. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why the, the member takes such offence at an idea of a program that, for instance, promotes trees being planted, promotes low-cost solutions trees. to reducing carbon. Why is it only the high-cost solutions to reducing carbon? We'll bring forward a pragmatic plan. We'll bring forward a responsible plan. We'll bring 
moving forward a plan that does not, however, have the highest carbon tax in history, $150 a tonne, which is one, which one of their members suggested. Hand up for the tree. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's not a plan. That's a path to disaster, and it will be done on the backs of taxpayers. On the backs of taxpayers. In September, the Environmental Commissioner released a report order. that warned of the impacts of scrapping Ontario's climate change plan without providing a replacement. In the response, the minister wrote back to the Environmental Commissioner, and I quote, I want to respectfully advise that any suggestion saying we should pursue policies that betray the commitments we made to the people will not be taken. In retrospect, in retrospect, I wait. These comments can be viewed as a warning and perhaps even a threat against an independent officer of the legislature. Order. Is the Premier firing the environmental commissioner because he wants an environmental lapdog, not a watchdog? Minister. Mr. 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 Speaker, Mr. Speaker, under the proposals that the uh, that the member is misrepresenting, they will still be Ontario will still be, ask the member to withdraw. Withdrawn. Uh, under the proposals that are being so characterized by the member, Ontario will still be the only province that has an independent environment commissioner, independent through the auspices of the Auditor General. A very important uh, step, I think. But, Mr. Speaker, again, what is it about? the NDP that makes them frightened about talking about other options? What is it that makes them so concerned about anything except putting a tax on Ontarians? On something as complicated as climate, why can they not see there can be more than one solution? Why do they insist on punishing on Ontario families like the previous Liberal government did? We won't do that, and we stand by our commitment. That concludes the time that we have for questions, oral questions this morning. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I need to make a technical correction to my response to the member opposite regarding the projects at the Thames Valley School Board. Funding has been allocated and continues to be allocated to these projects. The Ministry of Education will continue their work with the school board to move these projects through the approval process. Uh, approvals. Thank you. A member for Waterloo on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, during the uh, debate on Bill 47, I would like to correct my record. I said the next election is three years, five months, 11 days. In fact, it is three years, six months, 11 days, five hours, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce and welcome to the House Harvey Bishop, who is the president of the Ontario Secondary School Federation. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 47, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000, the Labour Relations Act 1995, and the Ontario College of Trades and Apprenticeship Act 2009 and make complimentary amendments to other acts. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
I'm going to ask the members to take their seats. On November 20, 2018, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty moved third reading of Bill 47, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000, the Labour Relations Act 1995, and the Ontario College of Trades and Apprenticeship Act 2009, and make complementary amendments to other acts. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Bethan Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tibolo. Mr. Tibolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downing. Mr. Downing. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Serma. Mr. Serma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Trantafilopoulos. Mr. Trantafilopoulos. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Kusindova. Mr. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Corth. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Corth. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Baumann. Mr. Baumann. Mr. McKenna. Mr. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Teddy Gasson. Mr. Teddy Gasson. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Sabawa. Mr. Sabawa. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Mr. West. Mr. West. Madam Jelly. Madam Jelly. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Tabby. Ms. Singh Brenton Center. Singh Brenton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Nadish. Mr. Nadish. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Satter. Ms. Satter. Ms. Bagan. Ms. Bagan. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamaka. Mr. Mamaka. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes being 69 and the nays being 45, I declare the motion carried. It resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Kingston the Islands has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks concerning the Environmental Commissioner. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.